I would like to welcome all people who are with us to listen to this webinar. And uh, first of all, I would like to welcome all panelists who, <laughs> who join us today and they prepared great presentation for today. Uh, so we have Linda May, we have Miguel Angel of Caro, we have Lou Atkinson, we have Simona Pajawiene and Aneta Worska. Um, so we <laughs> will try to interest, to interest you and we have uh, beautiful slides to show you how important it is to exercise during pregnancy and how we should uh, and why we should overcome the barriers uh, to physical activity during pregnancy and postpartum. I'm going to share the screen for our presentation. In the meantime, please use the chat. Uh, we would like to know what country you are from. Sometimes I can see uh, that, that uh, yes, oh, I can see that you can use the chat, so it's nice, but I cannot see the, oh, yes, <laughs> hello, hello, Katarzyna. So please go ahead, tell us uh, what country you are from. I'm sure we have a very international group of people and all are uh, very welcome. So I'm sharing the presentation. Before we start, I would like to thank a lot to my university, Gdańsk University of Physical Education and Sport in Poland, and also the Super Mama Birth School for the organizational support and people from the Super Mama Birth School are also with us today. Um, and responding to your frequent question, this webinar is recorded uh, and this webinar, this webinar will be available for 24 hours on the uh, Facebook um, and you can watch it for 24 hours using the um, fan page of the birth school and later we will prepare a recorded material for you. It will be available on the university YouTube channel. Okay, so I'm from US, Mo, hello, hello. I'm from South Africa, South Africa, Bulgaria. Oh, that's great. And we have also people from Sweden. Uh, we have also people from Italy, Norway. Uh, hello, everyone. So yes, that's nice to see uh, that you are all in China. Perfect. So uh, we have great, great audience from all over the world. Uh, I will shortly introduce you our experts. So first, uh, the presentation will be uh, done by Linda May. Linda is from the East Carolina University and she is the co-director uh, of, uh, of Human Performance Lab at this university. But what is also very interesting, she is also the co-chair and co-founder of the American College of Sports Medicine Pregnancy and Postpartum Special Interest Group. And Linda will present uh, a few words about that. Linda has published numerous scientific papers in the topic of pregnancy exercise. Uh, it is around 70 papers, also book and book chapters. But what I like the most, uh, Linda shares her scientific achievements, not only uh, in the academic society, but uh, she also shares her expertise in worldwide media outlets, including the New York Times and Good Morning America, which was quite interesting for me. And the next presentation will be done by Miguel Angel Oviedo Caro from Spain. And Miguel, uh, uh, Miguel is uh, associate, associate professor at the University of Seville. Um, he has been involved in a lot of research related to physical activity and health, but one of the projects which interests us the most is the Pregnactive project. And I know that Miguel will present us a few slides about uh, this project is related to the objective assessment of physical activity level and um, it is related to objective measures to uh, lifestyle through, during pregnancy. And um, Miguel also is the author of many papers, scientific papers in the field of 
pregnancy and postpartum exercise and was awarded many times for his activity. Um, and the next expert, Lou Atkinson from UK. Uh, Lou is related to uh, Aston University. She is visiting research fellow and also honorary clinical lecturer at Warwick Medical School. She is also research lead uh, in the project EXI. I'm very curious about that. But what is, uh, I think, very, very important today for our webinar that Lou is also personal trainer and uh, pre and postnatal group instructor and she has a very practical approach and when she talks about um, some psychological and social aspects of being physically active during pregnancy I know that this is a very practical approach because she feels the, the market. Uh, and the last expert for today will be Simona Payawiene. She's associate professor at the uh, Lithuanian Sports University. But at the same time, Simona is program director in active training. So this is a vocational training provider. So we have a great perspective. We have a great combination because we have academic and also vocational approach to education and uh, similarly to Lou, Simona is also very, very uh, active personal trainer and also exercise professional. She uh, conducts beautiful Nirvana classes, for example. I know that there are many other, but I had the chance to attend the class, this class, Nirvana class and um, Simona uh, and, and, and Lou and, and Miguel, as I said, and Linda, they are all great scientists at the same time. So this is a perfect team uh, today to respond many questions. So for now, uh, it was just a very short presentation of the experts. This is our schedule for today's webinar. After the presentation, I will have a few minutes to present our NEPE project and I will explain you how to apply uh, for the training in November. I hope that many of you uh, will apply uh, and then we will have 15 minutes for questions and ask answers. So you can use the chat in meantime when the presenters have their presentations, uh, but probably we will have time uh, at the end to respond to these questions and we have to finish on time. It will be uh, a quarter past five uh, because there are some other events run by our organizers, so we want to keep the schedule. Okay, so I think that we can start. Elinda, the floor is yours <laughs> and I'm happy to invite you to have this presentation on very interesting and important topic, the effects of uh, maternal exercise mode on maternal, but also infant health outcomes. Linda, please. Thank you. Thank you so much for um, having me here and allowing me to present. Um, hopefully some of this preliminary data about the effects of maternal exercise mode on maternal and infant health will help everybody realize a little bit about the importance of why we want women to exercise during pregnancy. So I'm going to try to cover these objectives, explain maternal health outcomes, review infant health outcomes, and then briefly at the end, discuss some opportunities related to networking and collaborations. So the preliminary data I'm presenting really is um, from one of our studies that's doing a comparison. I will try to use the pointer, let's see. Here we go, hopefully you guys can see that. So you can see over here on the left of uh, cardiovascular aerobic activity versus muscular strength or resistance activity or a combination of both, all at this 150 minutes um, per week of moderate intensity exercise, which is the guideline um, for America and, and other countries as well. And so what we find 
with the maternal health outcomes with these four different groups, you know, the three exercise groups compared to non-exercise controls, is that you can see here maternal blood pressure response. Um, any type of exercise is beneficial, and we see an improvement in maternal blood pressure. And this is not just at the beginning of pregnancy, but continually as a trajectory across pregnancy, we see improvements. And interestingly enough, our resistance group or muscular strength group shows the greatest improvements in maternal blood pressure. And especially for the women that are overweight or obese, they do better if they have some type of muscular strength, either by itself or with aerobic activity. Uh, one of the other things that we do is we measure some of the um, metabolites in the blood and DHA is one of our markers of interest. It's a polyunsaturated fatty acid. It's important in maternal health, um, pregnancy outcomes, but also fetal nervous system development. And we can see um, not related to her diet, but as the pregnancy progresses, DHA increases if she exercises. And then you can see here, the combination group of aerobic with strength training does the best, has the highest DHA, and then resistance only or strength only or aerobic only are about the same, but all groups are better than controls as far as those DHA levels. So that's exciting. And then other metabolites, we're still analyzing, all of this is preliminary data, we're still analyzing, but we can see the aerobic only exercisers, they have lower triglycerides, which is important, and increased uh, metabolism of those phospholipids. Whereas our muscular strength or resistance group, we have increases in arachidonic linoleic acid. These are associated again with polyunsaturated fatty acids, which are important again for maternal um, pregnancy outcomes and fetal nervous system. And then we can see this combination group with aerobic and strength has in, uh, changes basically from both of those groups. And so that's mom's side. We're also interested in what goes on with baby. So for the fetal outcomes, basically all of this says the fetal heart improves. So left ventricular stroke volume, for example. And what we've noticed so far in our preliminary data, the pattern's the same. So a combination group has the most improvements for the fetal heart. And then um, strength alone or aerobic alone are about equal, but all exercise is better than women that do not exercise or the controls. Um, same thing for these other uh, fetal heart outcomes. So the uh, end diastolic volume, the pulmonary uh, valve velocity flow, for example. And then regression analysis shows, again, preliminary, that exercise type predicts uh, these outcomes, but definitely intensity. And I think that's something that's important. So it's a dose response. And that's an important, I think, point to tell women. So just a little bit is better than nothing. Um, and the attendance as well. So doing a little bit is better than nothing. And that's a really important um, point. And then fetal morphometrics or the body type. Again, it looks like on our preliminary data, the fetus also um, has decreased body fat, especially if they do aerobic only. Okay, Linda, so I will stop you for a moment because, you know, it was a great slide before <laughs> because uh, we usually talk a lot about the maternal health outcomes and that's, that's great. We, we know a lot uh, about the benefits um, for mothers, but you presented as very specific health benefits for the fetus already. So I think it's something that we should spread with the mothers. The information should be released uh, very often because it is, you know, specific <laughs> benefits that they should be aware of. So thank you for this. Okay, go ahead. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. And then I guess the important point, not only do we see benefits um, while they're still in utero, but it's important to follow the babies afterwards, right? And so birth outcomes, again, we look at the metabolites in the baby's blood. And what we notice is that it looks like the metabolite signatures uh, are four different distinct phenotypes of these babies, depending on and what exercise they were exposed to. And so you can see here, I don't know why it's jumping. <laughs> so you can see here that regardless of the type of exercise, I'm not doing that, I really am not. That regardless of the type of exercise, the polyunsaturated fatty acids are increased. Um, so that's all important. Glycerophospholipids, those phospholipid layers are increased. So regardless of the type of the type of exercise, the baby's cells, the baby is getting benefit. But we also notice that some benefits are going to be very specific for the type of exercise. And so this is something that we're interested in. I don't know why my slides are yes, playing that yes. Well, I don't know why it's, uh, so maybe some Jumping. of the panelists is uh, using the presentation. I maybe, have... okay. So then um, we continue to follow the babies uh, four weeks afterwards. So if there's not a programmed effect, then they would detrain and we wouldn't see differences. Um, but at one month, we actually still see differences. So upregulated pathways in the baby's blood at one month of age 
ATP and energy metabolism, the phospholipid layers, gluconeogenesis, for example. And again, we see similar patterns with baby's DHA, again, critical for baby's nervous system development, in the same pattern that we saw for mom. So combination seems to be higher, resistance only or aerobic only seem to be um, a little bit less than combination, but all of them are better than women who do not work out. And again, this is baby's blood. Interestingly enough, our preliminary data shows that downregulated pathways for baby are things like pain and inflammatory pathways. And again, that's really important for trying to decrease disease in the babies. So then one month outcomes, again, all preliminary and we're comparing to controls here, um, but we can see similar patterns. Um, so aerobic, we have less blood lipids in the infants at four weeks, less in resistance, but that combination seems to be the best. Uh, BMI Z score, we see the same pattern. Our cardiometabolic risk score, another composite score, we see the same pattern with uh, strength or combination being the best. Our resting metabolic rate, we're still analyzing this data, but interestingly enough, the babies exposed to aerobic exercise, we see increased metabolic rate at rest, um, even at four weeks of age. Uh, motor skills, again, improved. We want these babies to be movers and be able to move to hopefully maintain these benefits. And we see the same pattern. So improved with aerobics, muscular strength, definitely improved in combination even better. And then our mesenchymal stem cells are, are stem cells that we take that are fetal cells. And then we look at the oxidative capacity of these cells. And we see, actually, this should be an increase. We see increase in aerobic, and then we see even more with resistance in combination. And then again, as uh, many other people are doing, we bring uh, hope to bring the babies back uh, as they continue to grow up to see if the patterns are still there. So at six months of age, our small data set shows that body composition is still improved in the, these babies. And also the um, glucose levels and the lean mass are correlated from six months to one month. And so this is an interesting finding um, that seems to maintain this program, hopefully a healthier phenotype of these babies from one month to six months of age. At 12 months of age, similar patterns, so decreased skin folds, improved body composition at one year, um, whereas the babies still have less triglycerides and glucose at rest as well. And then uh, our older babies, so our one to five year range, again, we still see decreased circumferences, decreased BMI, uh, again, compared to uh, those you know, four groups. And interestingly enough, our groups that were exposed to muscular strength alone or in combination with aerobics seems to still have the greatest outcomes even as the babies get up to that preschool age. And then lastly, again, that was all preliminary data. Interesting, but hopefully to help women um, be interested in wanting to move more during their pregnancy. But as Anna said, I also want to mention this American College of Sports Medicine group that we have. We're open to anybody who's interested. It's called the Pregnancy and Postpartum Special Interest Group. Uh, so again, the purpose is to provide a means for people with this common interest related to pregnancy and postpartum, you know, physical activity or nutrition and all of these things to help women to be healthier during and after pregnancy. And it's really to help just meet and talk about these um, interests. The activities, again, we promote and develop um, pursuits related to pregnancy and postpartum initiatives. Again, activity and nutrition, mainly um, focusing on it as well as clinical care. Definitely provide a forum so that people can talk about these issues and try to bring solutions and collaborations together and definitely serve as a network, um, again, for educators, researchers, exercise physiologists, physiotherapists, physical therapists, clinicians, anybody interested in working with pregnant and postpartum women and, and the babies to try to improve their um, nutrition and their physical activity and their clinical care. Um, all focused on improving outcomes, right, for moms and babies. Um, so who can join? Anyone. Um, ultimately, you do need to be a member of the American College of Sports Medicine. Um, that's pretty straightforward, but everybody's welcome. If you want to join our group and, and come to the meetings, just send me an email. And we are happy to um, involve everybody in our projects and, again, try to improve health outcomes for moms and babies. So quick review, hopefully I covered these outcomes briefly, but again, um, maternal, fetal, infant benefits for any type of exercise. We do start to see some differences um, with specific types of exercise, but in general, any type of exercise is beneficial and definitely something is better than nothing, right? And then for the ACSM uh, special interest group for pregnancy and postpartum, all are welcome to join, network and collaborate. So happy to welcome everybody.
Okay. Okay, perfect. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Linda, for this uh, very um, short presentation because I gave you only just 10 minutes and I minutes. knew <laughs> it would be very difficult to uh, present all this material. But uh, as I said before, it's great to have this data. It's really, really important even, you know, to see that the uh, fetal response is beneficial to uh, the exercise of the mother and also that we have good um, reason to exercise for children who are one month old and also one year, five years. So it's not only the genes, I can say that some children are healthy or not uh, and the motor skills are different. So it's not only genes, but also the lifestyle, not only after childbirth, but already how the mother um, exercise, uh, what is her lifestyle. So it's really, really important. We have some question to you. Uh, also, you already responded uh, about the intensity, but later uh, I hope that we can uh, have the chance to read it um, and, 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 and discuss. So thank you very much, Linda, for now. Uh, and we will go to Miguel. Miguel um, has the presentation related to quality of life during pregnancy. So my first question to Miguel is what is the health related quality of life? Please start, <laughs> Miguel. Thank you, Anna, and thank you, the, the NIPE team, for allowing me to participate in this exciting project. Nice to meet all the audience, uh, and I try to answer the question, what is heritage quality of life? Uh, at first, uh, we want to, to explain that in the prenatal care, uh, include uh, among its goals to support and encourage healthy psychosocial and sociological behavior and to help address the influence that pregnancy can have on pregnant women and their families. In the screening of the prenatal care, several biomarkers are widely addressed, such as glucose levels, blood pressure, weight gain, fetus development, and in order to reach all objectives of the prenatal care, to evaluate preserving health is also important. The quality of life concept was defined by the World Health Organization as individuals' perception of their position in life in the context of the culture and value system in which they live and in relation to their goals, expectations, standards and concerns. This general concept has been specified by the United States Centers for Disease Control and Prevention as health-related quality of life, which is defined as a broad measure of perceived health that provides a basic understanding of health status and a cell of well-being. So, how we can evaluate quality of life? Breck and College in 2022 has published this systematic review in, in which uh, they aim uh, to identify instruments used to measure quality of life during pregnancy and also between uh, during postpartum period and to describe their characteristics and psychometric properties. The most reported and validated instruments were the short form 36 health survey, the 12 item short form health survey, and the World Health Organization quality of life questionnaire. In addition, a specific tool has been also designed to evaluate quality of life during pregnancy and the postpartum periods, such as the mother generated index, the maternal quality of life, and the quality of life gravitarium. In the NIPI training, we will expand the information about the use of this tool among pregnant and postpartum women. So I invite you to participate in the next edition of the NIPI training. In this slide, uh, I want to, to summarize the uh, scientific evidence about the quality of life during pregnancy. We can use a show systematic uh, review to summarize this scientific evidence about quality of life during pregnancy. At first, uh, Lagadet and colleagues in 2018 described the quality of life during uncomplicated pregnancy and assist its association with sociodemographic, physical, and psychological factors. Author 
established that while the physical component of quality of life decreased throughout pregnancy, the mental component was stable and even improved during the course of the pregnancy. The main factors associated with better heredity quality of life were mean maternal age, primiparity, early gestational age, the absence of social and economic problems, among others. However, the main factors associated with poor quality of life were medically assisted reproduction, complications before or during pregnancy, obesity, and the prevalence of pregnancy related symptoms. In other way, both Eve and College in 2022 described the evolution of quality of life during uncomplicated pregnancy. Pregnant women, mental and physical domain scores were lower than population door. It means that pregnant women have lower quality of life levels compared with non pregnant women of the same age. During pregnancy, quality of life increased from the first to the second trimester, then decreased in the second and third trimester, notably in physical health, mental health, and social functioning. In addition, frequent pathology during pregnancy, such as obesity, low back pain, and pel pelvic girdle pain, have a negative impact on the heritage quality of life of pregnant women. Okay, so I will stop you for a moment because we've uh, had some uh, evidence based on other authors and it will be your project, right? The Pregnant Active Project and it will be your outcomes, Miguel, right? Thank you, Anna. I will summarize the findings of three articles from our project in where we focus on the analysis of the association of hair rate quality of life with physical activity, cardiorespiratory fitness, pregnancy related symptoms and sociodemographic factors. In the first article, uh, we want to um, answer the question, what about respiratory factor or therapeutic quality of life? In this study, we aim to identify potential respiratory factors and establish heritage quality of life levels of healthy pregnant women at my pregnancy. 134 women was evaluated at my pregnancy using the medical outcome study 36 eaten short form for the quality of life, the six minus world test for cardiorespiratory sickness, physical activity was measured by a multi-sensor sensor a mini arm bar monitor, and pregnancy-related symptoms was evaluated by the pregnancy symptoms inventory. In the NIP training, we will expand information about the use of this tool and on pregnant and postpartum women. The result of the Steve Wise multiple regression models showed that cardiorespiratory fitness, muscle skeletal symptoms, and age were identified as a platonic factor of the physical component summary of her related quality of life. While cardiorespiratory fitness is associated with better quality of life levels, muscle skeletal symptoms, and age are associated with poor quality of life levels. Explanatory factors of the mental component summary include musculoskeletal and psychological symptoms and light physical activity. While physical activity is associated with better quality of life levels, musculoskeletal and psychological symptoms prevalence are associated with poor quality of life levels. In the second article, we um, investigate about how pregnancy-related symptoms influence hair-related quality of life. The aim of this study was to analyze the potential association between pregnancy-related symptoms prevalence and hair-related quality of life during pregnancy. 155 pregnant women were evaluated at my pregnancy using the medical outcome study 66 eating short form for the quality of life and the pregnancy symptoms inventory for pregnancy related symptoms. The result of the regression model showed that back pain and shortness of breath were explanatory factors of lower physical component levels. 
while feeling depressed and anxiety, were explanatory factors or lower mental component levels. The result of our study highlights that an early detection of the pregnancy related symptom that may affect her quality of life uh, of pregnant women enabled to develop early intervention aimed to ameliorate the negative impact on her related quality of life and daily living activities. Okay, Miguel, and I think that it will be the most interesting slides for our topic today about the physical activity and the relationship between the health-related uh, quality of life, right? So, am I right <laughs> in this slide? For, um... Yes. Uh, in this study, we, we want to analyze the association between the fulfillment of physical activity guidelines and her related quality of life, social pregnancy. For this, 78 pregnant women were uh, longitudinally evaluated at the same point throughout their pregnancy, at my pregnancy and a later pregnancy. Physical activity was objectively assessed by the Martin Sensor Monitor and pregnant women were categorized by the fulfillment of the minimum physical activity recommendation at least 30 minutes a day on at least five days a week. Quality of life was evaluated you, uh, by the medical outcome study 36 eating short form and the psychological pregnancy symptom by the pregnancy symptom inventory. Pregnant women who fulfill the physical activity recommendation reports better mental health and quality of life both at my pregnancy and also at later pregnancy. Regression models showed that the number of days meeting physical activity recommendation contributes to better mental health quality of life, while depression and anxiety symptoms prevalence are associated with lower mental quality of life and later pregnancy. Our results suggest that while meeting physical activity recommendation is associated with better perceiving mental health, physical component of quality of life is explained by other factors such as age or pregnancy related symptoms prevalence, but not only by meeting the minimum physical activity recommendation. Yes, and this is the data that we should give to all the doctors and the doctors should give the data to all the pregnant patients to convince them that they should exercise. Right, Miguel? Yes. <laughs> okay. To summarize the the, the, the slide uh, uh, we want to or, or we uh, we call uh, we call um, highlight several points. Uh, health quality of life uh, provides a broad measure of perceived health and a basic understanding of health status and sense of well-being. Uh, compared with non-pregnant women, health quality of life levels are lower uh, during the pregnancy period. Uh, throughout the course pregnancy, physical component of quality of life decreased while the mental component was stable. Uh, maternal age, primiparity and other factors associ are associated with better relative quality of life. Uh, higher physical activity levels are associated with better mental component of quality of life while higher Cardiorespiratory signal levels are associated with better physical component or quality of life. And in addition, complications before or during pregnancy, obesity and prevalence of pregnancy related symptoms are associated with poorer quality of life. In the, in the next article uh, that we uh, publishes in the, in the next date, uh, we uh, analyze how the High intensity inter interval training uh, can influ influence to the health quality of life of pregnant women. It was a pleasure to collaborate to the professor Anna Sumilewicz um, College uh, to develop this uh, randomized control trial. Um, I hope uh, you like uh, reading this article. So thank you, Anna. Okay, thank you very much, Michael. And thank you for presenting our common paper, which is under revision. And uh, thank you for sharing your conclusions and your observation and also this uh, uh, paper on high intensity interval training. I am a very fan of, of HIIT during pregnancy and I will have a few minutes about it uh, later on. Uh, okay, so 
from starting from Linda, we have benefits for the baby. We now could see the benefits related to the health quality of life uh, presented by Miguel. Uh, so all benefits, there are so many benefits. We understand it now that physical activity works to improve our quality of life. But the question is now why women don't want to exercise, why the rate of their physical activity is so low and why is it so difficult to convince them to be physically active. And I hope that Lou will respond to some questions from my list. Lou, the floor is yours now. And Thank you, Anna. Yes, yes. Before you start, I can say that we have quite con quite nice conversation in the chat. I hope that we will read the responses and continue it because some uh, questions related to uh, the intensity of exercise are, are I think, uh, important to be discussed together. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Linda. Thank you, Lou, that you already responded to some of them. So, Lou, please continue. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, so uh, my background is in uh, health psychology and understanding and influencing the determinants of various health related behaviours. Um, and I have specialised for many years now in uh, maternal health behaviours, particularly physical activity um, and weight management related behaviours. So I thought I would summarise for you today in the 10 minutes I have some of the evidence that we have um, now that's really um, quite quite solid and, and, um, and quite well um, uh, confirmed around what are the, the key psychosocial influences on physical activity participation in pregnancy. So just as Anna said, why is it that um, despite now having some really good science and some good recommendations um, that being physically active during pregnancy is beneficial for the pregnant person and for the, the infant as well. There are very low physical activity participation rates uh, during pregnancy really around the world um, with some specific cultural variations as well, of course. So uh, oh, and I should mention, because Anna said she was interested in EXI, EXI is a digital therapeutic tool where we're able to provide a tailored physical activity prescription for individuals um, under clinical care who have a range of long term conditions. And at some point in the future, I would love it if our platform would also have um, uh, an option to use it during pregnancy so we could have tailored advice that is specific for pregnancy and that could answer some of these intensity questions we're getting but that is my wish list for the future okay so as i said we have a really good evidence base now over a decade's worth of um of really good evidence around what are the key factors that influence whether someone is or is not likely to be active during their pregnancy. And we can really separate these into three key areas. Um, the first one I'll talk about is the intrapersonal factors. So these are really internal to the pregnant individual. Um, and any of you who have experienced pregnancy will be very familiar with these, I'm sure. Um, so in terms of physical um, uh, factors, uh, many, many people reporting that fatigue is a limiting factor. Um, you know, if we feel tired, if we feel fatigued, we're less likely to, to feel able to go out and, and be active and do some exercise. Similarly, lots of people experience, um, you know, relatively low intensity for many um, symptoms and discomforts associated with pregnancy, such as lower back pain, um, you know, uh, swelling, um, all sorts of different problems, um, tenderness and swelling across the body um, and uh, other unpleasant things like um, incontinence and hemorrhoids and uh, again, lots and lots of things which um, in themselves aren't physically limiting to being physically active, but will make that individual feel less um, capable or less motivated. On a more um, psychological level, we have concerns about safety and knowledge of suitable activities. So lots and lots of people reporting that they would be more likely to be active 
if they had um, you know very specific information about what are suitable activities and exercises what's going to be safe because um, somebody who is nurturing a, a, an unborn child um, is very naturally likely to tend towards a precautionary approach if they're not 100 percent certain that it's safe they won't do it and that's completely understandable so this is again where um, something like the nepi project can help in um, educating more professionals who can then pass on that knowledge to those individuals. Also, pregnant individuals are no different to the rest of us. Um, we're often short of time um, and actually pregnancy specific activities often take place in facilities at um, sort of off peak times so as not to take up the studio space or the gym space um, when you can get maximum numbers in. And unfortunately, that means perhaps sometimes late at night or during working hours. Um, and so having activities and options to be active at a time that's convenient is really important. Motivation wise, this is really relevant to what we've seen from some of my fellow presenters in that the motivation to be active comes from two key sources. One is from the maternal side, so wanting to um, keep themselves healthy, understanding the connection between their health and their unborn baby's health, um, but also specifically fetal health. And so I 100% agree with you, Anna, I cannot wait until Linda's data is out in the world and, and being screamed from the rooftops because the more evidence we have that being active during pregnancy is beneficial to the baby, many, many more people will start to, um, to be active during their pregnancy. We also know that motivation comes from weight management. There is an understanding that weight gain is of course natural and healthy and necessary during pregnancy, but having excess weight can, be, can increase risks and it can be harder to, um, to achieve a healthy weight after pregnancy. Um, but unfortunately, we also hear reports, lots of women saying, well, this is something I'll worry about in the postnatal period. Um, and then it actually becomes very difficult um, for them to restart or to start a new exercise program. Um, and finally, on the intrapersonal, the confidence. Um, if if a, a woman feels confident to exercise, she's more likely to do it. it. Sounds simple, but it makes a big difference. And a lot of that comes from past exercise behavior. So if they were previously um, regularly active, before their pregnancy, they're more likely to continue. And if they see themselves, um, if they see exercise as part of their own identity, um, they're more likely to continue with it. So on the interpersonal, what, again, what we see repeatedly is that um, people are more likely to be active during pregnancy if they have a supportive partner and friends and family um, who will endorse and support and encourage them to be active also, advice from professionals is absolutely key. We see this time and again in the evidence that if this is recommended and endorsed by a respected, creditable uh, professional, it's more likely to, to have an impact and activity levels will rise. There's a huge social element uh, around physical activity in any population, but specifically in, in pregnancy as well. Lots of social norms around resting, lots of cultural practices around protecting the baby and not doing anything risky um, and so women naturally will um, tend to adhere towards those social norms rather than try to be different um, and of course again we have lots of work and caring commitments if this is not the first pregnancy there will be children to be looked after there may be other relatives and um, and people to be looked after as well and on an environmental front uh, you know on the the wider sphere we know that having access to resources is crucial in any health behaviour um, and in pregnancy, this is specifically having resources around showing them how to be active and also having facilities. Again, pregnancy specific activities are generally preferred by the majority of pregnant individuals. Um, whether I'm in the UK, it's just turned cold and we will already start to see physical activity levels drop. Um, and generally those sort of environmental conditions, the, the safety and comfort, um, you know, combined with the facilities are really important. OK, I wanted to touch briefly on um, a paper that I published with some colleagues um, that was focused largely on a piece of work that the Active Pregnancy Foundation, who's a charity in the UK, 
conducted during the COVID-19 pandemic um, and uh, it's a charity I, I um, am an advisor for um, and what we wanted to do was try to use the opportunity of the pandemic to raise some of these um, issues and some of these barriers and say hey look this is an opportunity to disrupt this field and see if we can turn the negative into a positive and do something, um, you know, do something positive as a result. So these are a few of the key learning points that it's worth considering um, that have arisen during the pandemic when people were socially restricted. Um, so the first thing that we saw was changes to work and lifestyle patterns and an increased access and use of online physical activity and exercise content. So the survey that we ran at the Active Pregnancy Foundation indicated that between a third and a half of pregnant women reduced their physical activity during lockdown, but a third of them actually increased their physical activity during the lockdown periods. So there is clearly some um, disruption here to, uh, to normal lifestyle patterns that in some ways can be harnessed for positive uh, change. What we saw in terms of types of activity is that, of course, the accessible activities at the time were things like walking and cycling and what we call informal play. So maybe going to a park or a playground with with younger children, with families. Um, these all increased during lockdown. And these are all things that don't have some of those barriers that we saw in the previous slide around money and resources these are accessible to the majority of people so this could be something else that we could harness going forwards okay and also so you, sorry for the interruption that's very very good that we have some <laughs> good sides of the pandemic and thank you for yes. mentioning it yes so uh, yes it's, it's, it's very important to understand that some people uh, you know, could use the benefits of being uh, maybe locked down and have more time and have more other opportunities to uh, to enjoy, you know, physical activity and, and and please go quickly through the few slides yeah. that you left because we are a little bit short of time. So <laughs> I would like Hello. to see I, that. <laughs> yes, I'm very aware. Sorry. Um, so yes. So very quickly then, um, other changes that we saw again were um, more working from home. Uh, which, again, might increase the amount of time that people have to devote to being active uh, and increase access to specialised exercise content. So, again, removing that barrier of wanting content that's specifically for pregnancy that we might not be able to access at our local health club. Um, we can now access this uh, online for free or at least less expensively. Um, we also saw uh, differences in the way that individuals engage with healthcare professionals during the lockdown periods. Um, and we know from the evidence that health professionals have this really important part to play. But what this suggests is that when healthcare professionals were less available, women might be more likely to engage with other professionals who have lots of really, really good knowledge and expertise to share, such as exercise professionals. And finally, what we saw was a huge amount of pregnant and postnatal women saying that they were using physical activity during the lockdown period to help them to manage their mental health. And I think, again, this is another really key message that we can get across that physical activity during pregnancy can be very, very beneficial for that individual's well-being. Going back to Miguel's talk around quality of life. This is something that we uh, saw in what he presented there as well. So my final slide just briefly to bring this to some recommendations. And I've slotted this into the COMB model of um, behavior. So capability, motivation, opportunity being the key psychosocial determinants of behaviors. Um, so I won't take time to explain the model, but here are my sort of practical tips in terms of um, having some positive influences on physical activity during pregnancy. The first thing then is capability. We need to help women to understand what to do and how to do it and really emphasize what is safe um, so they feel confident to do that. We also need to provide tools to improve behavioral regulation. So when people are short of time, um, they're short of resources, they have conflicting priorities, um, things like prompts, things like action plans can help them to turn their good intentions into some positive action. Um, and also the more we can simplify and tailor activities to individuals, 
the more uh, able they will feel to engage in them and the more likely they will be to do them. For motivation, as I've mentioned already, we really need to emphasize the benefits for the baby. That is the key source of motivation for pregnant women. Um, and they are, are, are more engaged with messages around benefits for the baby than they are for themselves. We need to address some of the myths that we have, which again, we've been doing in the chat already um, around things like intensity uh, and just making sure that individuals are getting the facts and they're not getting it from their, their friends and family who were maybe pregnant 20, 30, 40 years ago. And as with any type of activity, the more enjoyable it is, the more fun it is, um, the more it feels good to that individual, the more likely they are to participate. So again, we need to find activities that um, are fun and enjoyable and don't feel like hard work. And finally, to increase opportunity, um, we need to provide practical support. So again, we need to find ways to make things accessible. So that online um, area may be a really good way to do that. Digital health is obviously something I'm passionate about, um, rather than having to have face to face contact with professionals we might be able to do that digitally or online and also the social support so making sure that partners that family members that friends that colleagues um, are, are all able to support that individual to um, to be more active these are the references if you want to know more and um, apologies for talking too much and I will happily answer questions later on okay, okay thank you very much Lou. I know you as I wrote to you <laughs> two days ago so even if you have four slides you always have great presentation and you have uh, you know such nice skills to present that everyone enjoys um uh, what you're talking about so thank you very much for very supportive information how we should work how we should encourage women uh to make them be more physically active and you mentioned a lot uh, about the education so this is time for simona presentation simona um, will talk about the um, competences about the educational standards so simona the floor is yours now okay okay hello everybody and uh, hello participants of this webinar from all over the world it seems impressive location from where you are and thanks anna for your work for your passion for your invitation and trying to make the world better i am really happy to be among such experts and even much more happy to particip participate in this project NEPA project and to do this educational course i my invitation if someone didn't decide so let's do today enroll to this course and participate but today i want shortly to um, describe situation the perspective from the training provider side not from the woman but more from the training provider side and the question is simply why parental sessions should be supervised by competent exercise professional why simply question maybe because of many many trainers with the title influencers because a lot of advices a lot of suggestions a lot of training programs you can see in social media maybe because we don't want to have complication during pregnancy maybe because we still have a lot of myth related with pregnancy and postpartum and we don't want to connect to face them in front of fact or maybe because pregnancy is the time when woman starts new life and do steps first step in more healthy and active life and we need to organize safe pregnancy that's the main answers but this question to the women who are pregnant and who are still discussing and raising this question do we need a trainer qualified trainer are you really competent expert in human anatomy biochemistry biomechanic physiology do you really understand how body is affected by pregnancy and physical load and how to combine both 
Are you sure you know the problem with your body's functionality? We have often cited reason for reducing or quitting physical activity. And women experience uncertainty about how to exercise safely. Their concerns about harming the baby. And here we, exercise professionals, should play a key role, but not only for training, instructing, programming, but for educating pregnant women, for encouraging them to exercise. Because environments, society, families, they are not so confident, they are not so, um, they don't experience a physical literacy in this area. So we are not only trainers, we are educators and promoters. But situation sometimes is like on this picture, when in traditional gym or fitness club, entering wonderful pregnant participant. And what is happening? Many trainers, they try to avoid face-to-face -face contact. They try to escape a little bit. Why? Because fitness trainer, they don't feel confident in the area of pregnancy. They feel that they, the lack of knowledge how to do training program for um, pregnant women. So the studies confirm this. And here we have fear because we have problems with competence for the trainers to conduct class for pregnant and postpartum women. And this problem are lack of qualification and education in this field. Lack of new science-based knowledge because every day, every month, it's a bunch of updated science knowledge. And when I was a student, I could hardly believe about what we are talking today because of lack of skills in real practice, working with such population, because of thinking that I can adapt my regular training program, just, just do some small, small adaptation because of stereotype, old fashioned thinking, belief in myth, and that is fear and uncertainty. I want to show the competences to conduct the class from our friend, colleague, wonderful person, researcher, Professor Rita Santos Roca, from the last webinar of this uh, project, where she listed competences. Exercise professional should be aware about recommendation of exercise and physical activity during pregnancy and postpartum, health screening and pre-exercise assessment, fitness testing, exercise prescription, exercise adaptation. Also, exercise specialist should be healthy lifestyle promoter. He should help to find direction and new life with the exercise as medicine, food as medicine, and brain and mindset as medicine. What does it mean exercise supervision from the woman? Very simple. It's to have this through group fitness or individual program, but exercise supervision, it means identify needs opportunity, ensure proper technique, ensure progression, provide confidence, very important, provide regular feedback, positive reinforcements, and behavioral strategies for the lifestyle. This is like to make or to provide the safest possible training and testing environment. We want this for our woman. Prenatal and postpartum training is not about green or red. It's not about not allowed. Instead of putting off what women cannot do during pregnancy and postpartum, it's better to turn attention to all what women can do. So it's not cutting some exercise or some activity, but help body to function optimally, to support 
body changes and to prepare women for giving birth. How many exercise specialists are certified and able to supervise pregnant and postpartum women? Maybe question why women do not want to exercise during pregnancy is related because we don't have enough of qualified and certified exercise specialists. Let's think about how many of our clients in Health and Fitness Club are women. How many of them maintain exercise program during pregnancy? How many of them will come back immediately after delivery? Let's think in your country, in your fitness club, how many pregnant women do you see around? Is there are such group classes? Is there are some personal trainers who are working with such women? Maybe women are not active because they don't have educated qualification, qualificated uh, personal trainer. And science confirms there is a lack of well-designed prenatal exercise program in the market because it's not enough just to join the class, general class, okay, to choose Pilates, yoga, or maybe indoor cycling, but trainer said, okay, but please do less intensive, please be careful, please avoid some, but this is general class. This is not class for pregnant women. And only well-trained and qualified exercise professionals are able to conduct these specific classes or do personal training. And this can increase participation rate and this ensure safety and effectiveness. And here is our fantastic working group also with Rita Santos Roja and with Anna, and we are happy to present because we worked for the creation of the standard lifelong planning standard for exercise in pregnancy and postpartum. We hope that these standards will help universities, training providers, schools, or some presenters to prepare the best workshop in this area. This is EQF level four, and your purpose is to design and implement exercise program for clients with uncomplicated pregnancy and postpartum period. And we suggest, because we divided the standard in two educational model, models, and we suggest for training providers also to organize separate time for this model, exercise in pregnancy and exercise in postpartum. And learning outcomes in both models are about theoretical basis of planning, conducting exercise program, health issues, safety consideration, health screening, fitness assessment, prescription, implementation, adaptation of exercise, and also promotion of physical activity and healthy lifestyle during pregnancy and during postpartum, because it's two different periods of life. And our recommendation here to understand that minimum amounts of hours, contacts hours, it's 20 per model, but minimum amount of this education course, it's 100, 120 hours. If you are university, higher school, or if you have a possibility to have longer duration of this workshop, we are welcome because there are a lot to learn. Very important message. Message: The holder of this certificate are not endorsed to do any rehabilitation program, to provide some special exercise testing in the lab setting, to provide this testing prescription with complicated pregnancy, to prescribe any kind of medical or supplements to prescribe nutritional programs to diagnose psychological disorders or to do some psychological counsels to diagnose contraindication it's not our occupational role refer them to other specialists don't forget we have our competency and our occupational role 
and standards, they show this. And specific prerequisite for this lifelong learning exercise in pregnancy and postpartum would be really nice that you would experience personal training of skills and knowledge in advance if you want to deliver personal training for such client. Or you must be group fitness instructor if you want to deliver group exercise for such client. Because working experience is very necessary and recommended. Otherwise, our workshop cannot be successful. You have to have minimum um, competency. And I want to finish with this sentence. And you can read, but this sentence is even more important for pregnant women because she colors not only her life and future, but also future of child. And we exercise professional also, we color not only our future, but also future of pregnant women for when we are taking care and want to be them active. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Simona. It was a great introduction for my <laughs> time and uh, my uh, short presentation about the NEPA project. So uh, it was really great to, to, to listen to your arguments why we need the education. And I'm happy to read the chat. Thank you very much to be so active. So there are some opinions that, for example, in Bulgaria, uh, you don't need that you don't have the courses that you don't have offer for um, for exercise professionals how to develop in the topic of exercise during pregnancy and postpartum and also I have an opinion that um, yeah. someone I don't know uh, the, the the place where you are from uh, but uh, yeah. there's a personal trainer who admitted that would like to have more knowledge and more skills mm -hmm. uh, in our topic so all of you are invited to our training. So I will skip some uh, slides maybe because uh, we are really uh, having no time anymore. <laughs> we are almost at the end. So shortly about the project, uh, the new era of pregnancy and postpartum exercise. The project is run in Poland at Gdańsk University of Physical Education and Sport. But what is important when you cannot come to my university, the entire training is conducted online. We have lectures by the top class teachers from different um, countries and um, they are recorded for you so you can use the material. But what is also very uh, interesting and very useful, we have classes which are practical we will try to have them more so more practical classes when we present you what exercises are appropriate for the period of pregnancy and postpartum and also how to implement the exercises into the sessions conducted for your pregnant or postpartum clients and the practical assessment is also conducted entirely online so you have to record a session with your client when you teach uh, the pregnant individual how to, um, to exercise. We assess how you communicate. We assess also um, how you explain, how you give the technical tips and also how you correct this person to perform properly. And we have beautiful materials from different countries in different environments. So thank you very much, Dineta participants, for your effort and uh, for your input. Uh, we try to use some uh, learning outcomes related to the qualification released by Europe Active Online Provision of Fitness Services. So first, we want to use this knowledge uh, for our purposes, but also we would like to give you some tips how to do your training online. Uh, so the main goal of the NEPA training, uh, of the NEPA project is to develop and implement uh, a new international program. Um, we would like to teach you how to work with pregnant and postpartum women. And our main assumption is to use the recent evidence-based guidelines 
uh, there is a big change in the approach to physical activity during pregnancy and postpartum. And even if you are pre and postnatal exercise specialist, um, so it's good to update the knowledge and skills because especially within the last three years, uh, there was a big shift um, uh, in this topic. And we try to uh, follow the trends in the market. So uh, as Miguel mentioned, we have a project related to high intensity interval, tra interval training during pregnancy. And uh, we've already done a quite big experiment um, and we would like to share uh, how to do that with you. Uh, so I will have a few classes on that. Uh, and I will also present this project, which is called Hit Mama Project. I think that the biggest benefit of the training is that we have wonderful teacher. So this is the core team. These people were invited at the beginning and they support me in the program development and so on. They have the classes so you can meet them, you can talk to them. Uh, but also uh, during each edition, we try to invite new experts. So for example, Linda is our new expert and I hope that she will have the whole class about the uh, benefits for children um, uh, in the uh, coming edition in November. And we use um, very uh, professionally prepared materials like this book, uh, edited by Professor Rita Santos, uh, Rita Santos Rocha. Uh, and uh, we also try to promote some materials like the YouTube channel. This is also um, uh, the YouTube channel run by Professor Rita Santos Rocha. But this one, for example, is uh, run by Professor Margie Davenport from Canada. It is in English. And this is the free online course run by Professor Xian Guo. Uh, this is in China. And if you would like to use Chinese, because I've seen that, that there are some participants from China, so this is good for you. This is an example that, that can support your uh, work. You can um, sign post your clients to this material as well. And as Simona mentioned, uh, we try to uh, be to work in accordance with the uh, Europe Active Exercise in Pregnancy and Postpartum Lifelong Learning Standards. So uh, the learning outcomes are well defined and we know how to assess them. So if you would like to apply, I really encourage to do that. Uh, we start the next edition in November and it will last for four weeks. Uh, it is entirely in English, so the skills, at least the basic English skills, are required. As I said, it is entirely online and the participation is free, so we don't charge you at all. You are our guests and uh, the only expectation from you is to answer the questions about the quality of training, what we should improve, and really would like to improve this training in the coming editions. Uh, the program will include 150 teaching hours, so this is a lot and it must be done intensively and continuously. So this is the assumption of the project. Uh, so therefore, we have classes uh, in the evenings during working days and we start in the morning, um, morning uh, on Sundays and Saturdays, uh, so the whole day of, of training. But it also uh, include, includes self-preparation and self-practice hours. So some days will be for you to prepare, to uh, have some time to, to, to read, or maybe uh, you would like to come back to the recorded material. And uh, we don't check the attendance. So this is up to you in which classes you want to participate. Of course, it's nice if you are <laughs> with us, but we understand it's a lot. Uh, so all these materials available for you. And um, maybe a little bit uh, bad information for some of you. Students have priority in the recruitment process, but uh, we have usually available uh, free places for you. So even if you are not a student, but you are an exercise professional and you would like to attend the training, uh, please uh, fill in the application form. And um, yes, so we will uh, be happy to, <laughs> to have you. And uh, you must be um, exercise professional. So we require from you any document 
um, any um, certificate uh, with a confirmation that you have the skills to plan and conduct exercise classes. If you don't have any document, we expect that you will provide us with the video material. Um, so we are waiting for your application forms by the uh, 30th of September and the recruitment results will be published by the end of October. Uh, we have three stages of the recruitment process. So first we have to assess the documents. If you provide us with the video material, so we have to assess the video material and there will be an online interview. This is a short meeting, online meeting, 10, 15 minutes. We would like to talk to you. We would like to check your motivation, also your communication skills. Um, it is usually in a nice atmosphere. It's not stressful, but we would like to know who we are going to work with. And if you would like to have more information about the recruitment procedure, please visit the webpage of the project. And also you can see the criteria which we use for the assessment of the video material. If you would like to prepare one, you can write an email um, using these uh, addresses. So this is the project, uh, general project email address, or please write to me directly. And in the May edition, we recruited over 50 participants from 14 countries. I really would like to have more people from more places. And uh, uh, I hope that I, I will have this person, Elizabeth, as I remember from the chat, <laughs> that you are from Bulgaria and you will come to our uh, November edition. We have quite nice feedback from different places, from Iran, from South Africa, from Ethiopia. Uh, from Poland as well. Oh, Elizabeth, thank you. So you are the first <laughs> on our list to be interviewed and be recruited. If you would like to see more uh, feedback, more information, this is our promotional video. And this is the time uh, for the question. It should be, but actually we should, continue, we should uh, finish this webinar. So uh, I can only summarize what was going on um, on the chat. So there were some opinions related to intensity of exercise. Linda and Lou responded that, yes, the, this is a myth that 140 bits per minute rate is uh, dangerous. What we know that uh, women can exercise with higher intensities, especially if they were physically active, they were athletes, so they should continue. But uh, as I could uh, read, uh, there, sh there should be closer supervision for them uh, from the obstetric care providers. Um, okay, so thank you very much for positive opinions. Um, looking forward to this training. Grace Folly, <laughs> thank you. We are waiting for you as well. So maybe just one or two questions, not to be unpolite, um, if you would like to ask uh, something to our experts. Okay, no, no more questions. <laughs> so you understand what the deadline and the, ta the, the end of, of, of time means. Uh, so I would like to thank all the panelists. Uh, I would like to thank Linda, Miguel, Lou, Simona uh, for being with us. I, I'm looking forward to your uh, to your lectures, uh, to your lectures during the training, and uh, I, I know that um, that the participants will uh, enjoy it as well. And um, yes, it was a great pleasure to meet you again, and thank you for your cooperation so far. And Thank you all the participants for attending this webinar today. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.